<clears throat> on open distance learning research seminars. It's a penultimate session because we normally we, we start our seminars in February and we close the process in in November. So um, <clears throat> our professor here is is preparing the close out. The the closing session will be will be given by our our erstwhile um, Professor Dr. Um, Mabaledi Sieleto. She's um, she's already um, been appointed. It's such a huge gain for for the UNESCO chair. She's already been appointed as the director of the SADAC Distance Learning Center at, at the UNESCO Botswana. And it's all courtesy to being at the UNESCO. So we are proud at the UNESCO chair to have one of our own as a as holding a, a really bigger post and we, we lay claim to that. So Prof Roberts is one of us. <clears throat> Prof Roberts is a, is a member of the College of Education. He spent a lot of time, years, at our own um, university's Institute for Open Distance Learning. So we have in our midst, really, one of the, the, the celebrated professors who has done a magnificent, real, a lot of good work in, in ODL. Um, I always find myself bumping into Prof. Roberts in, 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 the, in the international conferences, sometimes without knowing, hey, Jenny, is, the, is that you? Hey, Moiketi. And this is the way we are. So as we move around the world to share our work and disseminate our research, Prof. Roberts is one of those people who is in the forefront of research in the College of Education ODL. So for me, I don't even need to read your CV because it's something that can take us a whole day just to say, this is <laughs> this is my colleague, my partner in crime. We are, we are, it's it's myself, it's Professor Hesh van den Berg, she's here, it's Professor Magwe, it's Professor Sidney Lengubani. In the in the College of Education, we, we are the, the, the people who are driving the, the ODEL um, research. Well, um, there are others that shouldn't think that their efforts are being undermined. So we have in our midst really a very seasoned person, a very one of our few established scholar or scholars of, of, of global presence. And um, um, she's here to share with us experiences in research. And in a sense, Prof. Roberts, um, this is an opportunity for you to to challenge us, to, to get us to think critically and more introspectively, and to really be, be more candid about the things that we are observing around us. Um, my reading of Socrates is always associated with that characterization of him as a philosopher who always conducted himself in recognition of the simple principle of paresia, you know, candid, open speech. And I'm hoping that as we go along and uh, engaging with Prof. Roberts here, we'll embrace that principle and culture of paresia so that we, we shouldn't be defensive. I mean, this report that has just come through, it would be important if we can dovetail it with, with that to say, what does it say to us as we perceive ourselves as a leading ODL institution on the continent of Africa? Are we? The report then has just um, painted us as a, oh, it's, it's very embarrassing to even think about it. But of course, there are others who are coming in trying to take advantage of it. But I think it, it's an opportunity like this is for us to reflect on ODL and simply convince ourselves that the little bit that we are putting through adds to the pedigree of this ODL research that we are trying to build. Prof. Roberts, the floor is yours. <clears throat> By the way, before we start, we have um, electronic if we, we normally applaud here by doing this, this is what I've been doing with the team. So we, we do the electronic applaud. And if you are happy with Proverb, you just say, thank you. You just put the emoji. So <laughs> we live in a digital world. Instead of wasting time, we have become an emoji culture. Go ahead, Proverb. Thank you so much. Um, and, and first of all, thank you so much for your, your introduction and also for inviting me. Um, it really is a great privilege to share I think as researchers, very often we're so bogged down in our own research. And the important thing about research is that it needs to be disseminated. It needs to be purposeful and useful. So I really welcome this opportunity to, to talk to everyone today. 
Um, may I just check to see if my slide presentation is up? Can you see the first slide? It, it, it's all here, it's very clear. Okay. You are also very, very loud. It's very, very legible. We can see it by all counts. Just so is ahead. everything okay technologically? Everything. Wise? May I begin? Okay. Um, well, let me introduce myself as well, but certainly not in the way that 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 <laughs> Proplitica has. I'm just going to say that my name is Jenny Roberts, and I'm a member of the Open Distance Learning Research Unit, um, which was formerly the IODL, um, and we're in the College of Education. And I would like to say from the outset that this is not just my work. Um, I, I, I firmly believe in working in teams, and this is a collaborative project. And I'd like to welcome and, and, and acknowledge um, my co-researcher with everything I'm going to present today is Mr. Hugo van der Waalt. And then I will also like to welcome my colleagues from um, CSET who we're collaborating with, and you will hear from them a bit later. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about ODL research. And we're looking at the kind of research that is coming out from South Africa, but I think also in other developing countries, because as we'll go along the line, I'll, I'll try and relate to say that our situation, I don't think is totally unique. Um, I think there's a lot of um, synchronicity with, with other developing countries. And all the way through, I'm going to be putting up evidence to suggest. So I might make one or two provocative comments or ask some difficult questions, and then I'm going to provide some of the research that, that, that you and I have been doing that can help us frame some of our answers. And I don't have the answers to the questions I'm going to ask. I think that's what the discussion is going to be about. I'm going to give you my opinion, which is wonderful, because normally when you're doing research, everything is referenced. It is um, This is an opportunity for us to have a discussion. We have scientific evidence to try and back up what I'm trying to say, but I'm really putting this out there saying, let's have this discussion about where we are in ODL research in South Africa and developing countries, and what do we need to do to improve it? So if I look and say, what is the overall aim, I think, of everything we're doing in terms of ODL research, and not just my topic today? And I think it, it, it's, in summary, it just says it's, to improve the levels, quality, and numbers of ODL articles published in accredited journals that are written by South Africans. And again, I'm going to add in other developing countries' authors as well, because there is a similarity. I can't go into that into too much detail. We don't have the time. Um, we have so much data, we could talk about this in many seminars. So that's the overall aim of what we're talking about today. And why is ODL research important? We get this question so often, particularly from, from staff members at UNISA who are not necessarily part of an ODL research team. So we're talking about people from other colleges. Why do we need to do research in ODL? And I think Cool put it very well here, where he said that no ODL institution of higher education can meet the local socio-educational needs adequately and effectively unless it engages in systematic research in order to make its products and services contextually purposeful. And that's really what it's all about, is we need to analyze what we are doing, at what level, and how contextually purposeful is it. So um, just to, for me to contextualize what we're going to talk about today, I've, I've sort of split this talk into probably four parts. Um, and we've really touched on what is ODL research and why. I've really spoken about why it's important. And you know, the field of ODL is a relatively new academic field. It's really only come into its own as an academic field from about the 1980s onwards. Um, and how do you measure a new field? It's by the research that comes out in that field. So there's so much opportunity to grow research in this field. And we all know what happened in 2020. With, um, with the COVID pandemic, we moved into online learning all around the world. And online learning is purely a form of distance learning. It's, the, it's a mode of delivery. And we moved into that mode of delivery almost overnight. Um, and how we're going to go forward with it is, is, is through research. 
And I'm going to use the framework. It's the best framework that I think we have available to investigate our research from South Africa. And I'm using Olaf Sawaki Richter's framework. Now, many of you might know Olaf. He's, he's a, a senior professor from the University of Oldenburg in Germany, and he's a friend of UNISA. I mean, he's, he's visited here on quite a few occasions, and I've had the, the pleasure and honor of working together with him on a few projects. So um, we're going to just disseminate his framework. What we're going to do then is look at our own research, and I, I apologize up front, there are going to be many graphs. I've made them as simple as possible, but that's the only way to describe for you to visually see what I'm trying to say. Um, and I will, I will explain them in depth and I have, try, I have tried to make them not too complicated, but there will be plenty of graphs. Um, and then after we've done that, we, we, after we've disseminated Olaf's framework, then we need to apply it to our research. What has been going on in South Africa? And here we're going to look at a time period from 2010 to 2014 and then a longitudinal study from 2015 to 2019. So this study was first conducted, I, I wrote a paper on this in, I think it was 2016, giving the results for the first five years. But we've moved on and it's very interesting to see where we're going. I can just say a snippet from the start is we've doubled the number of ODL publications in the second five year period, but it's not just a numbers game, is it? And that's what we need to look at. So I'm going to um, disseminate some of that information. And then where the discussion is going to come in is to say, is this context that was developed by Olaf and is really was developed for first world countries and not necessarily developing countries, and it was developed in 2009, is it actually fit for purpose for us here in South Africa? Or should we be looking at tweaking it slightly? Checks that need research and where we should be researching in our context. And that's where we're going to say, let's let's be critical and let's talk about that. And finally, because we come from a, a research department, we are encouraged or um, part of our, our mandate is to assist other academics at UNISA to publish in ODL as well, to have ODL research. And I think the um, IODL that, that it was then at UNISA had the Searchlight program, and we certainly did, did develop many new ODL scholars through that. Um, we need to take that a little bit further now. So with all this data that we've got, the final part of this project is looking at creating a technology tool to support ODL research in the various um, colleges. And that is the reason why we are now collaborating with CSET, because, you know, Yuga and I can't write those. And we've got um, Professor Yuko Lotret and, and Dr. Young Mintz, who are assisting and they're part of this program. So right at the very end, when I say my thank you, um, Professor Lotret is going to just do a five minute slot to explain this new tool that's being developed, which can only assist all of us in mapping gaps and areas for research in ODL. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few provocative questions. Um, and whenever we start with a research topic, I always say to the students, think about what is concerning to you. What worries you? What are you worried about? And the question that keeps on coming up in my mind is, why are the numbers of ODL outputs in international journals from developing countries so low? Why do we not have a bigger presence there? What is holding us back? And this is where we have to be totally open and honest and find ways to move forward so that we can be playing in this field. Because at this stage, and you'll see some of the res results when I put them up, we're only scratching in the sandpit here. We're not in the field. And UNISA, was the first open distance learning university in the world. We we're one of the mega universities and a mega university is described as one with over 100,000 students. Um, we should be leading the ODEL research in the world, but we're not. So let's put through a few hypotheses as to why not. And this is from my opinion, and this is, this is really how I'm feeling, and please, I would want you to add to it. But one reason I've said there is that maybe we're not context specific enough, or in other words, maybe our context is not of interest to the international community. 
Now, I find this very sad because I will go on to talk about developing countries and the numbers of students, etc. But bear in mind that most international journals, and I'm not saying all, but I'm saying most, are emanating from first world countries. They're from the United States, from Europe, from Australia. And our context is different, as we know. I mean, UNISA started as a correspondence university, and many of the universities in developing countries were exactly the same. Let's take another example would be IGNO in, in India. Um, we've got large um, distance education universities in Nigeria, in Indonesia, in Turkey, in Pakistan, all developing countries. And is there a reason or is one of the reasons why we're not featuring strongly in these international journals is because we are not playing in the same field as others. Many universities went straight to online learning. Let's think about Australia, for example, who never had a distance education university. And then suddenly the demand for distance education became very high. And that was because China wanted, they, they, they wanted qualifications from um, Australian universities for their students. There was no ways that Australia could online, face-to-face uh, -face, on campus, bring in hundreds universities in Australia started offering distance education courses. But of course, they didn't go into the correspondence mode. They went straight into technology and their infrastructure challenges are very different to those from ours here in South Africa and other developing countries. So the first hypothesis I've got is that maybe what we are researching is not context specific to um, to areas that are not developing countries. Um, the second one, and, and we have to put it out there, is is our quality not good enough? Are we not being published in international journals because we're just not good enough? And I, I would be hesitant to say that because that would be a very sad reflection. And I know that we have many highly qualified and competent um, researchers, but we need to look into this and say, is that another reason? And then the third one, and I can only give anecdotal um, evidence here is editorial bias. Do the editors not want articles from developing countries? And that's a that's quite a harsh question to put out there. And I'm going to just give one bit of anec anecdotal evidence is one of the um, editors of one of the top journals in distance education, who I do know quite well, and I had this conversation with him and he was honest. And he said to me, and these were his words, anything that comes from South Africa lands up in the bin. I don't even look at it. And that is really frightening. And when I asked him why, he said, because the quality is not good enough. So what they're doing is they're filtering out everything from South Africa and not even taking anything into account. And I think here I want to use an analogy. This is definitely like throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we know that we've got some top researchers here. Um, but let's look at example of what has happened in South Africa with, um, with COVID and the vaccines. And I think it's the same thing. The UK had us on their red list when, when our number of infections was minuscule compared to theirs. And the overarching idea was anything coming from South Africa is not going to have been tested properly. And we were blamed for the um, for the incidence of the Delta variant, for example. Uh, well, it's South Africa. There's so much um, corruption. There's so much this. Nothing good can come from South Africa. Yet it was the South African researchers who identified the Delta variant. So we've got some cutting edge researchers in in medicine, in the medical field. Yet we were still put onto that red list. And I think that might be what's happening with editorial bias as well. Editors are saying, look, whatever's coming from there, it's not good enough. So we're all being tarred with the same brush. Okay, so I've, I've made my opinions and my thoughts clear, and I'm going to be really interested to hear what everybody has to say about that. And I'm going to borrow from Prof Letzeker because he's put it so succinctly and, and, and carefully. Why are we doing this? And you know, 
if we look at Genesis innovation strategy, we are supposed to be a leading research university. We are mandated to produce ODL research. This is why it is important. Um, and there is a demand for knowledgeable, highly skilled and highly qualified ODL teachers and researchers. And also, he stated that there's a burgeoning culture of ODL research at UNISA. However, and this is the caveat, he says, given UNISA's size as a mega university, its research presence in the area of ODL is neither visible nor impactful enough. Now, I'm going to challenge that slightly and let's look at the actual facts and figures and let's decide, are we visible and impactful? My argument is we are, but not nearly on a scale that we should be on. I keep talking about South Africa as a developing country. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I'm not just lightly saying we're developing countries. There has, there are, there's evidence um, that is used to to suggest whether a country is developing or not. And for this reason, you would look at the World Bank Index, you would look at the Human Development Index and the, the Gini coefficient. I've done all of that. And um, according to them, here are some of the developing countries, and this is according to the IMF. This is not all of them by any means. I've just put up ones that I feel are important because these are countries where there's a large presence of, of ODL institutions. And I thought it might be quite good to compare ourselves to some of the research coming out of these countries. And you'll also notice here that the, the five BRICS countries are all classified as developing countries. So we see we have South Africa there. And importantly, we've got Brazil, China, and India, and Russia. We also know we have a, we have a large number of distance learning institutions and um, students in Turkey. We have in Egypt, Nigeria, etc. So these are sort of the country, the developing countries, and you will find that the top ten open distance learning universities in the world all come from developing countries. So that's IGNO, it's NAN, it's um, Tabruka, it's UNISA. I think we're about number ten there. OK, and here's another interesting fact, you know, according to the World Bank, more than 80 percent of the world's population live in developing countries, and that includes Africa, most of Asia, Latin America, as well as Russia. And that over 50 percent of higher education students in the world come from developing countries. So if we're looking at the international journals and saying that they're, they're possibly not pushing research or or encouraging research from developing countries, I think that's very short sighted because we're saying that over 50 percent of higher education students in the world actually come from developing countries. Um, so let's go back. I'm going to just reiterate my questions and, and maybe they're now a little bit more context specific and I'm really thinking about developing countries here. Is our research not specific enough? Are we? Are our themes incorrect? Are we looking at themes that are of no interest? Because if over 50% of students you know, come from developing countries, it should be of interest. We don't know about this quality and that's something we have to address. And is there still editorial bias and, and how significant is that? OK, so let's Put in context and I'm going to start with a very easy slide, not slide, but just a, little, a table before I get into the, the actual slides. And I just had a look in Scopus. Now bear in mind when we look at the Scopus journals, on, in the main we're talking about international publications. I know there are a few Scopus journals that, that emanate from South Africa, but most Scopus ones are um, international journals. When we look just now and we add the South African research or the South African published re research, we'll use the Sabinet database as well. But this is just to contextualize what we're talking about now. So using the search criteria for distance education, online, ODL, etc., we looked in Scopus where at least one author was South African and journals that have already been published. And we see something very interesting here. In 2018, 
we had 27 articles out of 680. In 2019, we had 39 articles out of 769, so probably a similar percentage. But look what's happened in 2020. We only have 26 articles out of over a thousand. And my first thing is to say, why? What's happened? And here, the only reason I can think of, and I want to go back to that editorial bias, is that I can understand why the world numbers almost doubled because of the COVID pandemic. Suddenly people were, all universities or higher education went online and there was obviously far more research coming out that way. What I'm talking about here, what has already been published. So what has been published is not coming from South Africa. We might have many articles that we have written and I have no doubt and I, I am aware that many researchers have written about ODL since uh, the, the, the pandemic but they have not yet been published. So we are saying worldwide, their articles are being published much sooner than ours. Okay, let's have a look at this and look at the developing countries. And in this slide, wherever there's blue, it's for 2019, and wherever there's green, it was for 2020. And again, we're only looking at Scopus published ODL articles in 2019 and 2020. And as expected, leading the pack is the United States of America, and that makes the most sense. And you could see in the first column there, they went from 201 articles in 2019 to 334 in 2020. So they didn't quite double, but there was an increase in journals. And the UK, although I thought there might have been more, they showed an increase as well. But let's look at where all the arrows are. And the arrows are pointing at developing countries. And I would go straight to South Africa, which is the sort of the orange arrow. And we're the only country besides Russia where our ODL publications dropped from 2019 to 2020. Again, I want to clarify and say I don't think we didn't write them. They just have not yet been published. So what has been published predominantly has come from um, developed countries. Have a look at Germany there in the middle. They more than doubled their publications. Um, Italy came from no publications to 25. France more than doubled their um, publications. So this is always giving rise to why are we not publishing have we written these articles? Are they not good enough? Or are they just sort of put towards the bottom of the pile and they'll get published eventually? Okay. And I'm apologizing if you're hearing meowing in the background. I have a cat who's very vociferous and she was sleeping when we started and she's woken up and she's now demanding that I scratch her ear. So when you hear a meow, it's my cat I thought, who... I thought, I thought you wanted her milk. <laughs> Do you think it was me? <laughs> no, milk. Okay, so I'm now moving on to the framework that we've used to disseminate all and classify all the South African research. Many of you might know this, but it's always useful to, to go through it again. And this is um, Olaf Sawaki Richter's framework, where he splits ODL research into three levels. The macro level with five sub-levels, the meso level with seven sub-levels, and the micro level with three sub-levels. And basically, the macro level refers to distance education systems and theories. This is research that is done by people who are guiding the field. We can call them the gurus in the field. Um, we, we, here we're talking about um, the George Siemens and the Alan Tates and the Rory McGreels. And I think this is where we should start playing because I think most of the players at the macro level are from first world countries and we need to get more ideas. And yeah, here we're talking about indigenous theoretical frameworks. We're talking about um, frameworks that are uh, pertinent to our situation. At the meso level, we're talking about management, organization and technology. Um, and there are seven sub-levels there. And as South Africans, we are playing in this field. And we'll see, we, we, we have improved our exposure in this field. And that, that's very pleasing to see. But I believe this is where we need to move more 
if we are going to publish in international journals. And that is where we are being incentivized. And here's another conundrum. We are being incentivized by government, by the university, to publish internationally. But we will see that most of our research is aimed at what we call the micro level, and it's very important. I think the micro level plays a, a very important role, but that is not necessarily of any interest to the international journals. So we know that, for example, we get double the subsidy when we publish in a, um, a an international journal than in a local journal. But surely we should be in incentivized to be publishing more that is context specific to us. So this, you don't have to look at this whole um, slide because it's far too much information, but that is a summary of each of those three levels. At the macro level, I said there were five sub-levels. And remember, these are the, the, the people who are guiding the whole field of um, ODL. And particularly of particular interest to us there would be um, access and equity, globalization, um, theories and models. At the meso level, um, there's, there's seven different categories there, and we'll see when we look at the figures just now that we are performing well in some of those, but there are some categories there where we're not we're not playing at all. And at the micro level, we're doing fine. So let's take them one by one, and we're looking at the macro level now of distance education systems and theories, and there are these five sub levels. So when I present the next slide, which is an analysis of it, I'm not only looking at international journals, now I'm looking at all our publications from South Africa. So this is any publication um, that has at least one author from South Africa. It has been published, and I'm going to give you two different time frames so we can see how we're doing. So at the macro level, We've got in blue from 2010 to 2014, so where we were playing in the field. And then an analysis from 2015 to 2019 as to how we have changed. And the overall here we can see is we went from three articles in 2010 to 2014, and in the second period we went to 12. So I think that is something that we should be proud of. And that that is going in the right way. And we can see at which levels we are suddenly publishing. Um, from two articles, we had four articles on access and ethics. Um, I think we should have far more. Globalization, we've gone up a bit, and we're starting to come through, but on a very small way. Now, bear in mind that all research at the macro level internationally is a very low percentage of total number of, of ODEL articles. In South Africa, it is particularly low. We're still looking at um, oh, less than 5% or so, and, and I think we should be looking at more. But this is where our leaders need to come at, the top people in the field. This is where we need to guide the field from a South African or, or developing country's perspective. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. Then we move on to the MISO level, which is management, organisation and technology. And you'll see there's seven different sub-levels here. Um, management and organization, costs and benefits, educational technology, innovation and change, professional development, learner support and quality assurance. And my contention here is that if we were publishing in the, these areas at these levels, I think it would be of interest to international journals. This is what they're looking for. It might be our context, but this could be appropriate internationally as well. So let's see what we are doing in this field. So this is the same. Again, I'm looking at all South African published articles. We will split them international and South Africa just now, but at this stage, this is everything that we've done. And the first thing we can see is there has been a big increase. We've gone up from 38 articles to 98. And that, that again is commendable. So we are playing in this field. But bear in mind that we increased our articles, we doubled them from 150 to 316 in the two different time periods. So everything should be at least double. But what stands out here, the area we seem to be specialising in is professional development. I mean, that makes my heart sing because that's my area. 
Um, I would just caution here, though, that there are only a few players who are publishing a lot. And I think here of um, an ex-UNISA um, professor, Adele Besadenhut, is she's working very much in this area and publishing, publishing prolifically, still associated with UNISA. And the HRM department in, in SEMS are, are publishing there. Hugo and I are working in this area. So we have, we are, we are showing quite a good presence there. What is very worrying is if we look at costs and benefits. We've only had one article, and we know that article. That was written by Dr. Thomas Hulsman and the late Lindiwe Shabalala. Now, Thomas was a visiting professor um, in the IODL for two years, about two, three years ago, um, coming with vast experience from the University of Oldenburg as well. And we all know Thomas opened up cans of worms. He, 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 went into every possible permutation that you can think of to come up with costs and benefits. And he particularly looked at the, um, the, 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 oh, sorry, I forget the, name, the, the signature courses that we had and the costs and benefits of those. And one of the big questions always asked is from the general population is, well, distance education should be so much cheaper because you don't have to have face-to-face -face lecturers. Is that true? What about the development of the infrastructure? What about the systems? You know, but we're not researching in that area. So I'm not saying we're not thinking about it. Remember, what I'm saying is this is where we're publishing. And I think we have a glaring opportunity here for somebody to take this on. The other one that is worrying is here if we look at quality assurance. I'm not saying that our quality assurance isn't good. I'm saying we're not publishing in this area. I do know that there are one or two people in said you have recently done PhDs who are working in this area and that the, that research might come through because remember this went up to 2019, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then it's um, interesting to see management and organization because I think from about 2015 around about there onwards, UNISA tasked the professional staff to start um, uh, publishing ODL research from their perspective. And you can see they took that on board and suddenly we had a bit more coming through there. I would say I'm not surprised that innovation and change, it has jumped, but we know UNISA is a very large animal and it's not easy to institute change, but this is where we should be leading change research. And then the only other thing I want to say about this is I've done research from other developing countries as well to see how we are comparing with them. I can't present that all today because certainly there isn't time, but I would just like to say with the research I've done from India, at the MISO level, we're fairly similar percentage wise. We're doing the same kind of percent at the MISO level that they are doing. But within these sub levels, they are very different. And then number one, where we sitting here as professional development being what we're doing well at, they are in the space here, educational technology. And I think we are failing here. And why is that? I mean, India is a very, very poor country. I, I'm, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but I would be quite confident to say poorer than South Africa, if that is possible. They have a population problem there, you know, with, with 1.3 billion people. I've been to India on numerous occasions, and I've seen the abject poverty there. Yet in amongst all of that, they have the technology. And we all know that, that anything to do with technology has been outsourced to India. So I'm not surprised that their research on educational technology is much more prolific than ours. And then we move on to the micro level, and that's teaching and learning in distance education. And this is where we are playing very strongly and most of our researchers. Um, but that's not wrong because that's what's happening all around the world. Your learner characteristics, instructional design, interactions and communication. This is very pertinent and it's very context specific. So I think it's right that most of our research is coming from here because it needs to be context specific to us and particularly at UNISA. So if we look at the results here, um, we can see that we've doubled our research numbers in this area. So we've gone from 101 articles to 206. And 
specifically instructional design, and that's very pleasing. Learner characteristics has also jumped tremendously. And I think I just want to caution here that, in my opinion, traveling regularly overseas, obviously not since COVID, but being exposed to the research that is happening in Europe, in Australia, in Canada, learner characteristics have almost um, been done. And I know that editors aren't really interested, but I also know how important this is in our context, because if we are challenging academics in other departments where their speciality is not distance learning, and that's most of the academics, to, to publish on their teaching, it's going to be in these areas. So I think we, we must continue doing it. We just have to be able to find where can we publish this locally that it's going to make the biggest impact, or at least in journals where the developing countries can benefit from it too. Okay, I'm going to take a one minute, not one minute, 10 second sip of water as we move on to, to wrapping up what has happened according to Olaf's framework. And this just shows us where we are. So from the macro level, we've increased, as we said, we've gone from three articles to 12. The meso level has increased threefold as well, and the micro level has doubled. So we are definitely playing in the meso level. And I haven't put a slide up here, but I'll just tell you about it. When I did the first research in 2016, I had a slide that showed with our international publications what levels they were at. And almost 90% of the articles that are published internationally come from the meso and macro level. In other words, the international um, editors are not looking at micro level publication in their journals. And again, I want to put, put it forward that we should be having that in our local journals. And we will see just now when we look at our local journals where the challenges lie. Okay, I've been talking about all publications from South Africa. And now I'm going to loosely divide them into Scopus and Sabonet publications. And why am I doing that? It's not cast in stone, but in general, Scopus listed journals are international journals. And Sabonet is the, the database for the South African accredited journals. I know that there are some cases where there are South African journals on the Scopus list and vice versa, but this is the easiest way to get an idea of how we are doing internationally with international publications and how we're doing with local publications. And once again, I want to clarify that I'm not saying that international is better than local, not at all. But I am saying that we have this conundrum that we are being encouraged to publish in the international journals um, when a lot of our work is at um, the micro level. So what's happening here internationally versus local? So the blue again is 2010 to 2014. And there we had 26% of our articles were in Scopus and 74% were local. So that was a, a, almost a 75-25 a, a split. And I think it's very pleasing to note that the green from 2015 to 2019, that changed. And we did start playing in the meso field and publishing there. And there we went um, from, I think I've got a, a typing error there, but I'm sorry about that. Um, Sabinet went from 26 up, to, well, it went up from 63% up to 74%. So we've actually started publishing far more in the, the international journals. So as you can see there, of the total 316 articles that we published, 198 were local and 118 were international. And that 118 jumped from 39 to 118. That was a big jump. Um, obviously, it's in accordance with, with an extra number of articles, but we are starting to play in this field. And now I think this is probably the most interesting slide of all, and I'm sorry that it is the busiest one, and I'll take, take you through it slowly. 
And the question is, where are we publishing? Which international journals? Which local journals? And the difference. So what stands out very strongly here is Progressio. Now, Progressio is the only dedicated distance education journal in South Africa. And you can see the blue bar, which was in 2010 to 2014, we had 63 articles from um, South African authors published in the journal. And we see this dramatic drop to 37. And I think the reason there, and, and other people can add to it as well, but is, is because Progressio has not had as many issues. There's been various challenges with the, with, with the journal over the past few years, and this is reflected here. But the question then is if everybody was publishing in Progressio, where do they publish now locally? And again, it's going back to what I was saying is it's important to have local publications, but where can we publish them? Then we look at, for example, the first one is distance education. Now, distance education is arguably the, the number one journal in distance education, and it's based in Australia. And it's pleasing to see that we have had an increase from four articles to 10 articles. And it's not just for South Africa to have 10 articles there, that's pretty good because the other developing countries don't, except for China. China has a large percentage of articles published in distance education. And I assume that is because many of their students are studying through Australian institutions. I'm not, not too sure on that, but that's interesting. But if we look at the next one, Irodal, which is based in Canada, I know, personally know, the editors, and particularly the ex-editors, and their stance was very different. They were very pro-publications from developing countries, and they wanted those publications, and they worked with the authors to ensure that the quality was good enough. And we can see the results, that internationally, that's the most prolific publications is Arodal for South Africans. We can see the next slide, which shows that the Mediterranean Journal, we had 21 publications between 2010 and 2014, and we all know what happened there. And we can be very pleased to note that we now have none. So everybody took on board what happened and had to find somewhere else to publish their, their articles. If we look at South African Journal of Higher Education, there has been an increased publication there. Um, and I think it, this is quite important because Remember that this journal is for all higher education in South Africa. So they couldn't dedicate more than one or two articles per issue to distance education. But because of the COVID pandemic and all higher education institutions going into online learning, you can see there's now more articles coming through there that are, um, are, are in distance education. This TOJDE is the Turkish journal. There has been a nice increase there, and the reason there is also pretty obvious. Um, it, this journal was not on the Scopus list until about 2015, 16, 17, round about there, when it was opened up and, 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 and in, included in the Scopus um, database. So we can see that we've started taking advantage of that and publishing there. <coughs> we can see African Education Review, um, which we know that Prof. Letseke is very involved in, and we can see we've got articles no, coming no. through there now. No, 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 Prof. No, Rogers. No, that's not my journal. not my journal. Is that not your journal? Sorry. No, this one, this one is Harry Okay. Well, this is, oh, 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 right. <laughs> it's my standing. Now I understand. Yeah, I okay. Understand. Well, here's a new journal then that I've just given you a credit for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for recognizing my journal. Thank you very I'm much. I'm recognized, but can you see how interesting that is that since your journal has come, that's where we are publishing locally. And because we've got to ask the question is, where are we publishing locally now that Progressio is not so easily accessible? And can, I, can I get in explain that? What okay. we do, Taylor and Francis, we, 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 we take a quarter of our journals to UNISA, we take a quarter of our articles to South Africans, we take a quarter of our articles to Africa, and then we take a quarter of our articles to the law. So that's why the presence of UNISA is quite high. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and what, what I'm showing is these are obviously not all the journals, but most of the journals listed to the right of the Arican Education Review um, 
are local Sabinet journals, but they are not distance education journals specific. They are subject specific, and this is very pleasing because we are seeing now when if you are in CSET or if you are in a, a College of Accounting or so, you can start publishing in some of your own journals where they are accepting articles on online learning. So here we see, for example, let's take Hartier S, and I will try to use my best Afrikaans accent here. Um, and that's Hervormde Theologische Studies. OK, it's a theology journal. And we've had nine articles there. And the reason for that is there are people playing in this field from theology who are talking about teaching theology in an online environment. And suddenly we're seeing articles coming through there. And I can say I've got one or two there as well on, on, in this um, space. We've got the Journal for New Generation Sciences, Gender and Behaviour. Quite a lot coming through from health professionals and, and interestingly, the South African Computer Journal. There are also journals on information science coming through. So that's where we are having to publish because we can't really publish in Progressio. So if I want to be totally open and myself and not be too polit politically correct, I'm going to put forward that we need to, as a matter of urgency, address this with context specific local journals, maybe that includes very similar to what um, Prof. Letseke is doing with, with the African Education Review, but purely distance education journals for emerging distance education researchers in developing countries. So that's me on my hobby horse. OK, so I hope this has given us a picture of the levels of research according to Olaf's framework, because that's up till now, that's what we've done. We've looked at the macro, the micro and the meso. What we haven't looked at yet is um, the trends or what are we publishing on? And is a nice, confusing, pretty little picture that looks like a whole lot of bubbles or balloons. And I know you can't see it clearly, and that's not the, the object. I'm just going to go through it very briefly and explain. This is an analysis we did on all the articles from 2015 to 2019 using the Leximanza tool, which is a data mining tool. What we did is put all the titles, keywords and abstracts, and it basically does a content analysis and sees which words come out. Now, I will tell you what they are, and the size of the bubble is dependent on how important or the number of hits that you've had with those words. So what is coming out strongly is distance, education and learning. And I think we should be very grateful for that, which means that the articles that we are analysing and writing are within the broad framework of distance education and learning. But what is a little bit more um, concerning is the smaller bubbles. And look what's coming in the smaller bubbles. This one here says online. This one says digital. And there's another one here, this one, that says technology. So we're, we're, we're scratching in the sandpit as well, but we're not really at the forefront with that. And um, Sam Naidu, who is the uh, editor of Distance Education and Olaf himself, they did a use this Leximanza tool to analyze all these trends in, in the journal Distance Education. I think they published it in 2016. And they did five year trends to see what are the most topical areas. And I did that as well for the South Africans. And what I found was that in terms of the trends, we are running about five years behind. I alluded to that with the um, uh, learner characteristics. It's been done. So in the international environment, they're not really interested in that. They would be far more interested in these the new technologies, this online and, and, uh, and the digital space. And we're not really playing there yet. Um, to make that slide just slightly easier, here it is. We can see the number of hits and the importance of each of the words. And here again, you can see the most important, we're talking about learning, education, distance, students. We're on target. That's Our articles are there, but we're not talking about this digital and technology. And where in here are we seeing things like MOOCs, like OERs, like other items which are going to just now that are trending internationally. And I don't think 
our context should exclude us from, from, from researching in those areas. Now, again, remember, this is all our research, and this is these are the areas that we are researching in. OK, so with all of that, I know I always tell my students, don't put too much text up, so don't look at all the text. Um, what are we going to do with it? Look at the purple. We really believe, and that the overarching aim of the study was developing a framework for ODL research within the South African context and developing countries' context, not just simply to use what was done by the Global North. So the OLAS framework to me works very well, and I can, I've, I've, I've tried with every article I've ever published, and I would challenge everybody here to look at all your own articles and try and see where it fits within OLAF's framework. But I do feel there's scope to maybe tweak it a bit to make it more contextually specific to us. And I'm going to just give you some ideas in one of my final slides just now. Oh, in the slide here. So where are our research gaps and our opportunities? Again, this is me putting it out there. This is what is open for discussion. I think we would double this if everybody else got involved. So I'm just giving my perspective. And first of all, I'm going to look at the meso level, and, and I've already said this. I believe there's a lot of space for developing indigenous theories and models that work for us in South Africa. And under research methods, I don't see anywhere in Olaf's framework about collaborative research, this concept of Ubuntu. What about um, joint PhDs? I've got a, a young lady who was a research assistant to me, and she's now doing her PhD at a university in Germany, and she's part of a project. I think there's 13 of them from all over the world, mainly developing countries. And they have a senior professor in charge who is running the overall project, which is on personal security and online teaching and learning. And each student has their own specific area, but they work together. It's a collaborative PhD, but at the end, each one will do their own. And is that not more the, the feeling of Ubuntu that we should be looking at here in South Africa? We are still doing our PhDs the same way that we've done them for many years. And I know in Europe, this, this is changing. So that's just a thought. At the MISO level, we've spoken about this, and I think we've got opportunities and gaps in, in, in most of those areas, particularly with costs and benefits and um, quality assurance. The micro level, I've put nothing there because we're doing it. I would just caution that when we're doing our research at the micro level, we keep it up to date and specific because characteristics and, and communication have changed as we've moved online and we need to take that into account. And then I look at the side and this is where I was just playing around. What are the areas that I notice from all my overseas um, travels and conferences? And I'm talking about the ICDE conferences, the Eden conferences, which is the European network um, and many of the others. What is coming up? What are the, the themes that are being presented there and themes that I think we are not even touching in our research? Um, I'm going to put for the first one here is OEP and OER. So it's Open Educational Practice and Research. Now, I'll, I'll, clar I'll clarify and say, I know we are working. There are people working in this. We have Professor Mpini Makwa, who's, who's the co-chair in this. But at this stage, we're not producing enough. This should be the, the forefront of all our, our research. So I'm saying there's space here for research. I'm not seeing very much on MOOCs. I know UCT have done quite a bit, but bearing in mind these are publications in Scopus and Sabinet journals, which we are encouraged to publish in. They have a more open um, scope for where they publish. So they are publishing, but not in Scopus journals. Where's our research on artificial intelligence? What about badging and accreditation? You know, online learning pedagogy states that you should be chunking your, your, your presentation. So we're not giving big presentations, we're chunking, we're going into small chunks. And we need to have accreditation for small chunks because then it might be more doable. And this is, there's a lot of research in there. Gamification has been around for ages. I went to a conference, a distance education conference in New Zealand, and I think it was about seven or eight years ago. And the, the, the main feature, the main debate was on gamification. I know a lot of us are using it in our teaching, but we're not researching on it. 
data analytics is right up there. Now, again, I know that other departments at UNISA are involved in this, and particularly IR, and producing reports. But where is our research? Uh, I also know that Professor Paul Prinsloo has been, been working in this area, but it's all very small. We could be doing far more. Social justice, I mean, where's our research here? How can we, what are we talking about here is, we are expecting students in rural areas with no infrastructure to be coming online. Where's our research about this? How are we gonna do it? What's working? I've spoken about collaboration in Ubuntu. Digital literacy skills, you know, as far as I know, I've got a, a master's student who graduated last year and she, she does happen to be a UNISA employee as well. And she did her, her whole um, dissertation on measuring research of digital literacy skills in, in the UNISA students in the Eastern Cape. And she had some very fascinating findings. But that needs to be expanded. We can't just look at an Eastern Cape, we need to take it a lot further. And when we did the literature review for her study, we found very little there. These indigenous theoretical frameworks, I've alluded to these already, coming from the macro level. Um, and online learner support. We've got a lot of work on learner support. We, there are a lot of people who, who have researched this. But learner support moved last year into an online environment. And I'm talking particularly face-to-face -face tutorials were replaced. It's now online counselling. Um, and there's very little being written about that. And fortunately, I do have one PhD student who's submitting his proposal right now on an assessment of student satisfaction with online learner support at UNISA. This is a new area here, video conferencing. Have any of you heard of Zoom exhaustion and fatigue? Not just saying we're tired of Zoom, there's actually a scale being developed by academics at University of Stanford, and it's a validated scale measuring the physical and psychological exhaustion and fatigue because of using video conferencing. And at the moment, I know of a, a, a master student at FITS in their medical faculty who's actually doing this because for their specialists, all their um, training moved to online. So now they'll have worked a full day in theatre, for example, and then they have to have their video conference at five o'clock. And most of them are going to be doing it on a small device, their phone, their smartphone, in the car or while they're at home and distracted. And this is measuring that. And I don't know about you, but I think every day from UNISA, we are getting another webinar, another webinar. Nothing wrong with it. But my goodness, I think it might be getting a bit exhausting. Let's measure that. We've got challenges with infrastructure. Where's our research on how are we going to do this? What about electricity, Wi-Fi, hardware, rural connectivity? We're not seeing too much research there. And my big bugbear is this one. It's the under-preparation of students for higher education and the associated challenges within the basic schooling system. Our students are not prepared. They come from school underprepared. And, and what are we doing about that? And what are, how are we researching that? And I would take it even further. I have a PhD student now who was accepted into their PhD because he has a good master's, but his master's was a coursework master's and he was exposed to very little um, research. I have students who've done a four year BTEC and get accepted into a master's and they don't know the difference between quantitative and qualitative. And we're not providing those bridging courses. We're having to do that as supervisors in that first year, but that is adding to our workload because we are now teaching research design and methodology to students who should have a reasonable grasp of that. And the final area I've put here is the pedagogy of care. And for those of you who um, were in the virtual conference that Prof. Litseka organised early, there was, I forget her name now, but the, the lady from, I think it was the University of Cairo, who spoke about this in depth. And what are we doing about it? What are we researching on the, 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 this pedagogy of care? So I'm just saying these are areas that I think, just off the top of my head, there are gaps. We, we, are not, we are not researching these areas adequately at the moment. And I think anything, any research that's carried out here would be of interest to the international journals. 
And then finally, I'm just going to say that um, as I finish here now, and I'll have one slide just to close off, we are talking about the development of this user-friendly ODL dashboard tool. All the facts and figures that I gave you here are from a database that Yuka van Valt and I have created, and it's taken years of work. And whenever we're finding gaps or we, we, we're looking for the figures, we're doing it in Excel and by hand. And we know that this can all be done very easily um, with the right technology. And this is why we uh, are in collaboration now with, with, with um, colleagues from CSET. And they are developing this, this dashboard tool and I'm going to hand over to them as soon as I close off now. And I think it's Professor Yuko Lotrit is going to just spend five minutes telling you about this tool that's going to assist us in finding these gaps. So to end off, um, just to wrap up what I've been trying to say is, who are we? All of us here are ODEL practitioners. Why are we here today? Why are we listening to, re to, to a presentation about ODEL research? Because I think we all want to improve our ODEL teaching and practice through relevant, up-to-date and context-specific research. And how are we going to do that? By becoming research practitioners who are knowledgeable and understand the academic field of ODEL. And we are now going to hand over to Professor Lutridge, who will tell you one of the, 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 the ways we are going to do that is through the development of this, this tool. So at this stage, I'm going to say thank you very much. I've done a lot of talking. Thank you for listening. I apologize about my cat meowing. She's gone back to sleep. And um, I'm really looking forward to the interactions we're going to have as soon as Professor Lotret is finished. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, good morning. Yes, morning. and yes. thank you um, for the opportunity to say something. I just need to find out if I can share a presentation with you in some way. Um, I don't see my share button working, but if not, then maybe it's fine. Then, then share with your permission. I'll just speak to, to our contribution. Okay, so just uh, in terms of, of, of CSET, um, and the collaboration we're having with IODL, which makes us very excited. Um, let me just also do this, and then you can see who's, who's speaking to you. Uh, we've, we've, over the years, we've had quite a challenge in, in CSET in the sense that there wasn't much Adele research happening in CSET. And I think the reason being the same as for many of the other colleges, the, the, the young researchers and the developing researchers primarily need to develop their scientific careers and uh, as a result their reflections on their own teaching practices uh, do not get published a lot. So, so it is a challenge in our college that there is, is a limited output of, of Odell publications. The other thing that we realized as a need in the college was that our teaching and learning needs to be informed also by scholarship in the area of, of Odell. And so originally under the leadership of Professor Gugu Mochi, um, we started thinking about how we can address all these issues uh, in CSET. And we came up with the idea of a flagship that focuses on a specific mm. aspect of, of Odell, and that aspect would be scholarship of tuition and learning or SOTAL. Um, and unfortunately, Prof Mochi has left us, but the idea was, was strong enough that the idea is ongoing and recently the, the application for a SOTAL flagship in CSET was, 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 was lodged and we hope that there's going to be a positive outcome. And the idea of the SOTAL flagship is indeed that we will push the knowledge generation around adult teaching and, and learning in CSET for the benefits of society, but also for the benefits of, of improved scholarly tuition and learning practices in the college. And so the, the collaboration with IODL then is under the banner of this flagship, which hopefully will be approved very, very soon. And obviously the idea is that we bring aspects into the collaboration that we're excited about. And us being a college of science, engineering and technology, um, 
those are the aspects that we're specialists in, and hopefully those are the aspects that, that we can, can contribute on. And uh, I like this new framework that, that uh, Prof. Roberts proposed just now because I see quite a lot of technology in there. Um, and obviously technology is always in service of humanity and obviously technology is always highly contextualized. But I did like seeing stuff in there about MOOCs and about all kinds of aspects of, of technology. And I'm sure that CSIT can, can indeed come, to, come on board in that regard. If we look at the, the project that, that um, Jenny and Hugo basically drove for the past five years, they've done, as you can see, an incredible amount of research. And it's very useful if you think about it from a um, developing researcher perspective. So if a young researcher comes into the Odell space and wants to do some research, let's say in a science engineering and technology environment, um, the kind of information that they've gathered over quite a number of years now is quite useful in terms of saying, well, I'm interested in doing this kind of research at this level. Let's see what exists at that level and where it gets published. And then surely that will help the, the young researcher to become aware of what's available and to position his or her research in that context. And so the idea uh, and it originally started also with, with Jenny and Yuhu, but, but uh, Jan Mens, my colleague, and I were quite interested in seeing how this thing can develop. The idea was to say, well, can't we use technology in some way to, to facilitate the, the usefulness and the accessibility of the, the, the research information that was, was gathered in this way? And can we provide some kind of, eventually, hopefully, some kind of almost a research awareness platform? where especially developing researchers can in some way use technology to interact with the research information and to in some ways, let's call it, play around with it or manipulate it and to get very clear and interesting maybe indications of the status quo of research in, in their specific space. Uh, and this this might be then very useful in terms of, of um, of uh, very quickly uh, focusing in on one's own research interests. And so to do that, obviously one would probably start with some kind of a technological tool without being more specific than that, and then see how it can develop as a system and whether people then adopt it and use it and find it useful. So the idea that we have is to, to develop a first, let's call it the first concept tool that in some way can be used to, to represent this knowledge that, that sits in this database that's been created and to make it visible in ways that are useful. Uh, and then to take this first concept and to share it, and we were thinking of maybe doing it in CSET as a case study, uh, and share it with the developing researchers and see whether they find it useful, whether they would want some changes and whether it could work. And in that way, through an approach that we call design science, we can then develop a kind of a platform that will hopefully uh, contribute to the development of, of Odell research in CSET. But then if it works, hopefully also then not just as a, a pilot, but to be expanded to, to other spaces in UNISA and possibly beyond. So there's quite a bit of research that, that needs to be done, but we think it will be interesting. It's an interesting way for technology to possibly support Odell research and awareness of Odell research, and hopefully doing Odell research eventually by, by more researchers in UNISA. They can maybe get excited if they see that there are some gaps that are under research and it's something that they're interested in. And I think with that, I've spoken enough. So thank you for the opportunity and thanks, Jenny, for a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Roberts, and thank you, Prof. Ludic, for that input. <clears throat> um, I think this was undoubtedly an eye-opener of a, of a presentation. I need to move out of this place. <clears throat> um, my domestic executive is running super kitchen machines. They can open the door for me. 
So there's a lot of rumbling in up in the region. So just bear with me for a while. Prof. Roberts, it was the cat. With me is all the appliances rumbling in my kitchen. Right. And now I'm now in a safe space. <clears throat> right. Th thanks a lot for that. Um, and um, Prof. Roberts, thank you for for putting me on the spot. <laughs> But that's, I think that's the nature of scholarship. We need to engage with the scholarship that comes from within us, and then we need to juxtapose that scholarship with scholarship that comes from outside. But you mentioned a very important issue, which is context. And I think I pride myself with the simple fact that all my scholarship in ODL and ODL has always been <clears throat> located within the context. I, I got my temperature really running when you, you spoke about um, editorial bias. Um, and it's amazing that <clears throat> um, you ended up praising one of the editors of Irodol for being receptive to particularly South African uh, research and discourses. Um, but I had a, I had a very <clears throat> unsettling experience. I don't know if you attended the ICD conference. Yes, I think you were there. That was held in Toronto. You were there, Prof. Roberts, because I know there was a whole team from ODEL that attended that conference. One of the sessions there was chaired by Professor Paul Prinslow, and it was a session <clears throat> um, on editors. It's Prof. Prinsler was surrounded by editors, and I think Aradol editor was there. There were lots and lots of editors from around the world in ODEL journals. And the idea was for them to share with us what is it that they publish and why. But I remember vividly the, the editor of Aradol, a female, you'll know her, I wouldn't mention her name, um, saying, that with her editorial team, uh, when they they screen the manuscripts, they they pre-review the manuscripts. The moment they they come across a, a manuscript that comes from the developing world and that noticeably deals with developing countries' issues, they don't waste the time on it because they conclude immediately that. <clears throat> it's a manuscript of poor quality. I know that Paul picked me up. I was standing at the back. He picked me up out of that and said, Prof. Lezeka, would you want to comment on that? And I was furious. I was furious with that comment. I took that editor to task and said to her, no, scholarship is not regionally located. Scholarship is scholarship. If you then um, reject articles because of the presumption that articles that come from the third world are of poor quality. That is, I told her that, <clears throat> that that to me was colonialist and it was a bias that they needed to look into. Well, she she then apologized. I think she said it came off wrongly, but everybody else agreed in the in the room that that's exactly what she said. So you are you are your your commentary and you're touching on editorial bias. It's potent, it's alive, it's, it's, it's here, and I think we need to deal with it. We really need to do that. My, my view that UNISA is not visible, the context for that was to say, again, you know, we brand ourselves, even Professor Makanyo, when he was our boss everywhere, I had the opportunity to travel with him quite a lot, and everywhere we met uh, scholars on a global scale, he always proudly, announced that <clears throat> UNISA is, is the largest leading ODEL uh, research university on the continent of Africa. And, and that's, that's the rhetoric that we have always been associated with. And what I wanted to say in that quotation that you cited, Prof. Roberts, was that, and you, you alluded to that, I do mention it in, in, I think, in one of my books, that UNISA is a mega university. 
uh, by virtue of its status as a mega university. I mean, at the time when these debates were going on, INISA was was having a student count just over half a million. We have had to cut it down to just over 400,000. Even then, that continues to make us a mega university. So on the basis of that and the perception that we are a leading ODL university on the continent of Africa, I don't think we are, as a university, on that cutting edge leadership in terms of ODL research relative to these other characteristics. And I think we need to be there. We need to be at a stage where research in ODL throughout the African continent, if we get our ad right, it should be research that is really, uh, that draws from the work that we do at INISA. Um, we, we have just come out now, we, we, we continue to rank number seven or eight here in South Africa. We, we have never really reached the top five. And the question is why? I think we have the capacity, unless it is a capacity that, that is doubtful. Um, and Prof. Prof. Lodgett, um, I'm glad that you came into the picture because you and I um, have engaged a lot on ODL and Prof. Nguyen is here. I'm not sure whether Prof. Marco is here, but the three of us, and I'm glad you also mentioned Prof. Moshe, the three of us have had the opportunity to interact with CSET um, a lot on, I, I remember we used to be treated to that wonderful hotel called Silver Star Casino and lots and lots of sessions, including the conference that were held in Molder Drift at that lodge called what? Avianto. So I think there's been there's been a lot of groundwork, Prof. Lottery, that's been done at CSET. What we need to do basically is, is to ask ourselves, how do we consolidate that? I think um, I every time I speak to Prof. Meiwa, I always say to her, the, the, the colleges at UNISA that I think for me have done excellent as far as ODEL in, in terms of generating awareness and in terms of putting proactive actions out there is, is CSET and the College of Education. Others can, can, can tell me if I'm wrong. The College of Education has been running over now, I, I think, eight, ten years in Rome. They've been running this conference called Distance, Distance Education. Short. Yeah, I think it's decent education at a whatever. It's a it's it's a conference that the college of education holds on a yearly basis, and they choose a venue. But it's a conference that seeks to 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 galvanize ODL. I said Drangesbeck, I think they held it at the ranch the previous years. Um, the year ago, I think 2019, we were at, at Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, but it's that conference in the College of Education that focuses exclusively on promoting ODEL activities. CSAT has that conference. And I think for us, if we are to raise this pedigree, and this, this is the job that I'm charged to do at the UNESCO chair, which has been very, very difficult, is to get all the colleges, all the colleges to assume that responsibility of having either a colloquium or a conference or a series of seminars, like the ones that I'm having at uh, in the UNESCO chair, there must be some research-oriented activity that emanates from the college, whose focus is entirely on ODEL and generating debates. And I like what what's been happening at CSAT. I mean, there's a, a Prof. Lottery will agree with me. There was a difficulty in getting the scientists to understand, and eventually we said we are not trying to get you out of your scientific paradigm, but like in theology. When you publish a paper, it's, 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 it's proper that there is a section that indicates that this research is conducted within an ODEL framework. You don't have to write like the Tate of this world or the, 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 the Brenda Golis or the Litzakas of Pimpino. No, but it's important that your, your research demonstrates, even if it's a science, it, it's, it's, it's science that's taking place in the ODEL environment. So, yeah, but Prof, Prof Robert, one of the, the things that you are raising here which is of cardinal importance to me, is the simple fact that in South Africa, we have only one journal that is dedicated to ODEL, which is Progressio. But you also know that Progressio has had so many challenges. There were times when it missed its deadline, and I think it hasn't really been in a position to, to fulfill that. Shouldn't we be looking at, without creating competition, but shouldn't we be looking at 
pushing a complementary agenda where we say, given the areas that you have flagged, why can't we find niches in there? And then we we start journals that don't necessarily compete with Progressio, but that complement Progressio, that then expand the space in ODL so that Progressio is not the only journal that focuses on ODL. And I think this is one of the, the, the narratives and agenda that I am I'm, I'm preparing and I'm putting together a proposal. And I will have Professor Mashile in the midst just to say to him, we, this is not a way to say Progressio is not doing enough, but just to say maybe we need to expand the space more and let's find ways in which we can have journals that target maybe the meso, uh, the macro. We can have journals that target uh, all of areas, but with the view to generating debate and, and advancing the ODL agenda and, and supporting progress and being part and parcel of the mix in ODL. And I think that's the kind of narrative that we should be following. And I think for me, that's the way we, we, we can then have our own journals. Two or three years down the line, we should, if we are serious about it, have these journals first are created by the DHT because that's the starting line. Once we are there, I've just driven AER from DHT to Scopus to IBSS. I'm very much, I have a lot of experience in getting the journal to be multi-accredited. And that's the experience I'm willing to share. But the first point of call is, let's get these journals first accredited by the DHT and then as we progress, let's explore whether do we need to get them in Scopus. I think we should. We should get the general. Now that we also have Doge, we need to see if we can get them into, into the Doge index. So the indexing has expanded more. And I think this is this is my take. This is what I wanted us to think about. I will now invite my fellow scholar, um, Prof. Roberts, in your themes, you mentioned quality. Uh, Dr. Ruth Aluko, it's a colleague of mine from the Inis of Pretoria. In 2016, we co-edited a book on assuring quality in open distance learning in the developing context. She is one of the real role players in ODL. And I would like to, to invite Dr. Ruth Aluko to facilitate the Q&A. Dr. Aluko, the space is yours. Uh, thank uh, you very much, uh, Prof. Leseka. Uh, it's uh, it's good connecting with everybody again, and I I just want to say a very big thank you uh, to uh, Prof Roberts for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, when uh, Prof Letaka gave me a call, I told him that uh, this is my best UNESCO chair uh, seminar or whatever name we want to give to it. May, probably because I'm a researcher. And uh, Prof. Robert has touched on something very close to my heart. Uh, I've already sent you an email, and uh, I'm expecting to get my response, and a positive one for that matter. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Robert. It's a very wonderful presentation, uh, very eye-opening. And uh, I think for your intelligence, as usual, to put uh, you know, difficult information together to make it very simple. I think that is part of what I've benefited from uh, this morning. So over to colleagues, uh, it's time for question and answers. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, UNESCO allow, uh, chair allows us to unmute our mic if we have questions, or we could also put in the chat uh, if you have questions. I don't know which you prefer, Prof. Letzaka. We, we normally, we, we run both ways. The, okay. the easiest way the easiest way is to take three to four questions per round, but then to me will assist by checking in the chart to see if there are questions in the charts that need to be brought to your attention. But uh, look, you are the boss. This is where I leave it up to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lesaka. So over to my colleagues. Uh, please feel free, and uh, I think there are so many burning questions on my on my mind. Probably by the time we get through this, uh, they will have been answered, and I will not need to ask mine. But thank you very much. Over to colleagues, question and answer, please. Yes, please. I could see Angelo, if I could call you by your first name, Angelo's and up. Over to you, Angelo. You could unmute. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, <clears throat> 
So my question, um, Prof Roberts, is I know that, uh, yes, I agree with you that there isn't enough um, work being done around the theories and the policies and the procedures, but I in my experience, you know, working around, working with universities of when University of South Africa and also sitting in colloquiums where other universities are, UNISA's experience as a university is sidelined. Um, I know when we're compiling um, national education stats, we exclude UNISA from the analysis and, we're, and UNISA is done as a separate analysis. And the point I'm really getting at here is that distance education in South Africa is very much associated with UNISA. And, um, and UNISA itself is quite sidelined, which makes it very difficult to get to the point where, you know, developing comprehensive national policies um, as part of your research, you know, you know, unless you just want to write a paper and have it sit on a shelf somewhere. But if you want to work in policy, it's really difficult because there isn't that community of practice. Um, is this your experience or um, have I just been in the wrong um, colloquiums? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Angelo. Uh, because I don't know who is a prof, who is a doctor, I'm going to be using the first name, please. Just permit me. So thank you, Angelo, for that. Two more questions for Prof. Uh, Roberts so that uh, she can uh, respond. Questions, please. Okay, maybe I can't see any any end up and no comment. Uh, maybe I will just bring in uh, some comments, then uh, Prof. Robert could uh, uh, could respond. From my experience, uh, questions will start flowing uh, after the first set or so. I don't know why. Maybe sometimes people are hesitant or they are still processing their questions and comments. I think a, a comment from my side has to do with uh, the start of uh, Prof. Robert's pre uh, presentation, where you, you know, gave three reasons for uh, why uh, maybe we don't have enough publications, you know, in the, from, uh, in the ODL from the developing context. And I must say that I agree with all the three. Uh, there have been occasions where papers has, uh, were sent to international journals and they will tell you something like it doesn't, you know, address our uh, our context or something like that. Uh, there, we are guilty. I must say that the le developing countries uh, authors are uh, often guilty of poor quality papers uh, that has been proven over time. But uh, regarding editor bias, I, I think uh, that is a very strong one, and I want to agree with uh, what uh, Prof. Lesaka said. I don't think I, I was at Toronto, but I didn't attend that particular session where that uh, editor said that. But I, I think of late, uh, and I could pick that up in uh, what uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Robert said during our presentation. At the initial stage of IRODO, uh, the former editor, I will say, you know, was very sympathetic towards papers from the developing context. Uh, and I've had some positive experience with that. It was like uh, a developmental, uh, you know, uh, editorial job that he did. I think that was Anderson, if I could remember correctly. I can't remember who was there at that stage. But currently, we don't have such a person of that kind of art in the, on that seat again. And I've had some nasty experiences, maybe about twice. So editors, uh, I think editors are prejudice against papers from the developing uh, context. I attended an international conference where a top person told me that, look, uh, what the challenge will be for, uh, you know, the developing context to maybe come up with journals that will address their own situation. And I think uh, that set me thinking, and that was why uh, uh, I, I decided to edit a journal. It's a new journal. It's been accepted on DOAJ. It's uh, listed there currently. And, uh, you know, we're working on it. I think uh, we are working on our third volume. And Prof. Marco is one of the guest editors there. So this will be what will, you know, it will boil, boil down to at the end of the day. So I, I would like to have uh, Professor... Uh, Robert, and uh, maybe respond to some of these things. I, I'm looking at 
uh, if we look at developing capacity, you know, we need mentoring. I need mentoring, especially if you talk about, and I love the way you put, you know, the mess so you, you brought to, to focus. We all know Olaf's uh, framework, but the way you brought in what we are doing, you know, to speak to that, I think really touched me. And I think there are scholars like myself that need mentoring, you know, in those areas. How could we come up? What can be done? You know, what, what do we want to organize? Who wants to mentor us? I think these are questions on my own uh, mind. And uh, maybe I will invite uh, Prof. Roberts to respond to those uh, questions and comments so that we can take it from there. Thank you very much, Prof. Over to you. Okay, thank you for, for, for those questions. And there's a lot in there, and I, I hope I can and answer all this and with some discussion. If I go back to Angelo, it's Dr. Finn. Thank you for that. Um, yes, Eunice says, because we were traditionally the only distance education university in South Africa, we were excluded from policy level decisions for many, many years. And I'm sad to see that that is still continuing, although since the, the, the white paper, I think it was 2014 or so, when um, distance education was open to all universities. And I think it should change even more dramatically, having taken into account the pandemic, where the traditional universities have gone into online learning now as well. So yes, that is still an issue. And this is thing, this is something that needs to be lobbied at a much higher level because I don't see why UNISA should not be part of policy making decisions about all higher education. Um, so that, that, that I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that, and I, I don't sit at that level. I, I don't play in that field, but but I think Prof. Letzeka and and various others um, are, are the right people to to be doing that. Um, if we move on um, to the reasons, there's three reasons that I gave for uh, our lack of publication, and and obviously when I put in the one about editorial bias, that that was very difficult, and you know I did that. A couple of years ago when I did this first um, paper on it in 2016 and I presented that <laughs> in my naivety at an Eden conference where all these editors were sitting um, and they were very uncomfortable and we even had one or two senior members from UNISA there, um, not more senior than we are, um, who were uncomfortable that I was raising this. But at that particular conference, a colleague of ours who has been in this discussion today, um, who's very senior, a senior professor from another college, and has done a lot of work in ODL, so has moved into that space and has been and has loads of publications. He was talking to the editor of one of the top journals, not our own, or one of the other ones. And he was completely dismissed and he asked him the question, what do I need to do to get you interested in this article? And the answer was, there's nothing you can do. I'm not accepting anything from South Africa. And now this is somebody, you know, so I've had it, I asked the question myself, I had exactly the same thing. But interestingly enough, when we go to the Irobel one, I obviously know who Prof. Letzek is referring to, um, and I, I know that their previous editor quite well, I was not in that um, editor's meeting in Toronto. I was obviously at Toronto, but I, because I wasn't involved in editorial processes, I wasn't there. So I must say I'm very surprised to have heard her standpoint there because that is very different to what she has told me. Now, I don't know, um, um, Dr. Luca also alluded to the fact that, that, she, that, that this editor might have changed her stance a bit, but um, I just think that is very indicative of what is going on in the rest of the world. So I would get back to um, the third point that Dr. Luca is alluding to, or, or what Prof. Lutzeka also alluded to, is having our own journals. And I think, thank you, Dr. Luca, I think that's great. And I'd love to get more, more details about um, your journal. And I do see on my phone um, the email from you, which I will respond to as soon as we finished here. Um, and I think that is incredibly important that we find the space to publish. Um, one of the the items in the um, uh, the, the that 119-page report that came out 
a few days ago that, that we were mentioning earlier, made mention that the IODL, and I don't want to be political here, I'm just stating facts, was, I can't remember the word they said, but basically disbanded. Now, that's not actually technically true. The IODL in the College of Graduate Studies was, but it was moved to College of Education, where we have a new home. But we're not no longer the IODL. And I think the important point I'm just trying to make here is we need to be having larger institutions, research institutions, whether it's into university, into college, spe specifically in a, a education, I'm not sure. But this shows the importance of that decision that was made that maybe it wasn't so important to have a research institute. We really need to have them. And I'm not saying it needs to be how it was, but we need to have them in place to be able to push these agendas. Dr. Aluko, Prof. Hose is on the line. He's raised his hand. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Roberts, for those uh, responses. I think uh, they are okay, and uh, I believe so many better things will emanate from these uh, discussions and from your brilliant presentation. Over to you. I could see a hand up. You could unmute, please. I think the name is Ignatius, if I'm right. That's correct. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And um, You're welcome, Prof. Jenny, thank you for a well-researched and meticulously documented presentation and also for practical guidelines for the way forward. Now, I want to link up to the contentious issue you mentioned, and that is the report of the Ministerial Task Team about UNISA. In the light of what has been said there, what do you think UNISA can do to support academics in order to publish more? Um, what do you think is holding academics back from research and publishing in this field? And what will academics interest to get them interested in research and publishing? Okay, well, well, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a very broad question about, about research support. Um, and yeah, um, so you want to know what we can do. I think I, I alluded to it just now is that um, staff members at UNISA, and this was shown in that ministerial report, are under enormous pressure. What was it, what did it say in the report? We're thirty percent understaffed. We've got so many vacancies, and particularly the teaching staff have got workloads that are not sustainable. And what? What that results in is that research is pushed to the back burner and research is seen as something extra I have to do because my IPMS says so. And w having run many of the searchlight programs at UNISA where we would have people who are really, really enthusiastic and have great ideas and we're trying to get them to, to we were mentoring them to get their, their articles written. What we found is that so many of them never completed because of a time thing. We would we would have searchlights set up and the, the morning of it would be, no, I'm afraid there's been a problem with the J router or there's a problem with this or we've got an extra meeting. So research is seen by many as being um, an extra that we don't have time for. I'm not saying here that people don't want to do it. I found a lot of enthusiasm for it, but no time. So I think that is something that needs to be addressed. Then we've got those people who are not enthusiastic. And here I, I've met quite a few educators at UNISA who I will say to them, what is your role? What is your job? What is your career? And they will say, I'm an accountant or I'm a geologist or I'm an economist. And I'll say to them, no, that's not your job. Your job is an ODEL teacher or lecturer in your subject and they're saying that's the same my field is geology so why should i be publishing an odl and i'm saying your field is odel um your field is odel and your specialization is geology so what you should be doing is publishing on how you teaching your speciality in an odl environment 
And it's that mindset that has to change amongst those people who are resistant. But I also feel strongly where people are resistant to wanting to publish in ODEL, I don't think we should try to change that. I don't believe that all 2,000, however many academic staff at UNISA need to be publishing this field. We need to find those people who are interested, who are committed, and then we need to provide the support, which was provided always through the um, the Searchlight program. And all we can say here now is I have actually been tasked to redevelop that and Yuka and I are working on it. Again, it's been a time thing and we hope to be able to to provide something that's going to be totally different, but to provide that kind of support as we go forward. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, it does. Dr. Dr. Luko. Uh, yes, Prof. I, I know that um, Fundy Bald Fundy wants to come in. Um, yeah, I see, I can see the end. Yeah. But I needed to just, if you allow me to add on to Prof. Robert's response, um, I think my my take is that there are lots of problems. There are lots and lots of people with a good heart and a passion for research at Ibiza. Um, and yes, you're, you're, you are raising an important issue of, of overload and the stresses of having to attend meetings. Um, but if, if I were to respond to that as an add on to Prof. Hose's question I, I would say that <clears throat> we need to get this passionate like-minded people yourself the likes of professor gubani professor and I, I i'm doing that now with the 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 unisa iodl conference we have created a, a very wonderful vibrant community we are coming together we are exploring ways of pushing the the envelope higher but i think beyond the conference we need to bring these minds together this platform that we are on right now, you know, when when I set up this platform with my team at, at the industry, we sat around and say, how do we make this a sustainable, continuous platform? And we put together plans. And I can assure you, these plans have now manifested. Three years in a row, the UNESCO chair, we are able to put together 10 seminars a year. Uh, this year, we, we were able to bring experts from Concordia University, you, you name it, uh, from Melbourne, Australia, from Mr. Tini. We need those minds, Prof. Holtz, where we can think broadly about how we create supportive and enabling environment for the cross-pollination of ideas in research. But how do we also create supportive and enabling infrastructure within the university, within our own departments or within our own colleges? When I said in the Department of Educational Studies, before I moved on to the NSC chair, Professor um, um, Pedro van Nikek came up with this idea and said, why don't we set up a brown bag culture of seminars? We did that. It, 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 it went on, started, started, and never really took off. But that idea was fabulous. We need to have a culture of research seminars across the colleges. That, that will be sustained by brilliant ideas, by bringing in people with brilliant ideas who can share their research. And then we need to also find ways in which we can harness these young people, create an incentive. Let's find ways to assist the younger researchers, secure funding for them. I've, I've, I've had an opportunity and a privilege of working with some of the members in the in the College of Education that I've taken by hand and worked with them to the NRF, managed to get funding for them. And they realize once young and emergent scholars find that role model leadership that shows them the line. A lot of people here got money. They started research projects. They started inviting people from as far as Uganda, as far as Zambia. And they were young and emergent scholars. So we need to also as school professors to really put our monies where our mouths are. Our role as full professors is, is really to provide that kind of direction, that kind of support, that kind of role modeling. And we need to avail the young and emergent scholars to our networks. What I did with my, my postdoctoral fellows was to take them to the Innis of Northwest to meet with Professor Yako Olifir, my partner in crime. I've taken them to Scotland. I've taken them to Dublin. 
at my own expense, my expense that I budgeted for within the industry. So, so we need to find ways in which we understand that when we have younger people, there is a passion for research among our younger people, but there are also challenges within the department as far as supporting those researchers are concerned. And this is where the wisdom of senior professors comes in. So I think we are raising a very important issue. Prof. Hose, this is a very important issue, and I wish we could find a moment outside this where we can extend this debate further and explore it and say, how do we then drive this agenda to its logical conclusion that we can turn it into a, a sustainable long-term project that can then be seen to bear fruits because we can then pull all our ideas, all our expertise, all our advice and say, here are the projects that we set up. One of those is to think about forming those um, journals. There's a new journal emerging in the College of Education, IJEDA, uh, and it's not accredited, but we are inviting younger people to publish in it. It's, it will definitely, I think, be, be ready for accreditation next year. So the more we can have all these journals emerging from colleges, and the more we can support them at conferences by giving them manuscripts, special issues, so that they can they can then grow and be ready for accreditation. So there's a whole vast area that, that can be explored. I don't know, Prof. Host, I know I want to touch on so many things, but maybe this is a conversation that we can have outside this, but I hope that my supporting co comments to Professor Roberts there uh, help to, as it were, put perspective in the question you asked. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lesaka. Uh, like I said, uh, when I first started talking, uh, I believe that uh, UNESCO Chair, you already have maybe your next uh, part of it anyway. It will not be the only one. But in the next line of webinars, seminars, you know, to organize, I think there's a lot of things to learn, especially in the field of research. So thank you very much. I could see another end up, or as the, the person changed his mind. Yes, please, two people. Yes, please unmute yourself, Van der Vaart. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, thank you, Prof. Roberts, for a very informal presentation. I just actually want to add a comment to um, the statement or the answer, rather, that Prof. Roberts uh, gave Prof. Hose on getting people on board with the publication in ODEL. Um, and I must say, I semi agree with the statement that if um, a lecturer or an educator in the UNISA context um, should be publishing on distance education papers. However, we need to consider the fact that they're also committed to their discipline specifically. I understand and I respect that, but we need to consider other ways of attempting to convince staff members or academics to actually work on these various um, levels, meso, macro and micro, for example. But um, the thing is that if we do in fact do this, we're going to see an increase in the um, micro aspect as well, because it's my assumption that the lecturers within their um, disciplines will only write as uh, research projects based on their teaching experiences, which falls within the, the micro uh, uh, sphere. But we need to find a way to also incentivize or increase the interest in MISA and macro. Now, I know that Prof. Litseka has got some things in place to, to address those aspects, but perhaps a suggestion is to, um, to have an, a form of incentive for any ODL publication uh, within the, the local South African context, not just for dist or international publications. If we want to push this um, ODL aspect, and, and especially with the, the, the MISA and the macro, I think we should consider maybe adding a, an additional incentive for ODL papers that get published locally. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. I think that also speaks to what we need to hear and the way forward. There was another end. If you allow me, Dr. Dr. Luko. Okay, Prof. I think, um, uh, Prof. Deval, I, I hear you, um, and I can assure you that one of the things that are exciting that are happening at UNISA is the, the, the passion, I think, that the finance director in the research directorate 
uh, Mr. Haribu Pape has shown to ODEL, and we are constantly in meeting. This idea that you're taking is that you just said is something that I, I, I have to assure you. I'm going to put it across to him, to Professor Labuskakne, and to Professor Meiwe, because I'm, I'm involved in a series of meetings to look into how to basically deal with exactly the issue you're raising, incentivizing ODEL. Um, Professor Opape has pushed us to developing a project that Professor Ngubani, Professor um, um, Vandenberg, and everybody else are in. I was running this college, this conference in the UNESCO chair, but the idea was let's make it bigger, let's team up. And in that space, the space, the question was how do we make ODEL interactions and research better? So I'm, I'm going to take that and put it across. It's a very wonderful idea. Uh, one of the things that I've been pushing as an envelope to the vice principal has been to say, and I think it speaks to what you are raising, uh, Prof. Andrival, has been to say that the way in which the UNISA research niche areas have been conceptualized is terribly flawed. Um, it was flawed from the very beginning to take ODL and put it in the mix as one of the old, as one of the niche areas, and then it becomes one of the areas that competes with others. I think what was missing in the policy conceptualization of the niche areas was the fact that everything else that happens at UNISA happens within an ODL environment. My suggestions to Professor Meiwa and Professor Buskarin has been that ODEL should not have been in the same part as these other niche areas. ODEL should have been an anchor where all these other areas are. And it would come back to what Prof. Ludwig was saying, that you need to find ways in which you cascade these areas so that they, they feed into ODEL. If the niche areas had been thought like that, where ODEL anchors everything else, each and every college would then have to draft and push their research such that it becomes responsive to the anchor theme, niche, which is ODEL. That's an agenda that I'm pushing forward now with Prof. Meiwa and Prof. Labuskar. So that contribution you are making, Prof. and Deval, is of utmost importance, and I take it with, with the, the importance that it deserves, and I'll definitely bring it to the attention of the vice principal. I just needed to highlight that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Lesaka. I think uh, that is uh, the way to go, especially when it comes to uh, institutional uh, perspective regarding ODA research. I thought I saw one end before I hand over to Prof. Lesaka again, or maybe the person's question has been answered. Dr. Aluka, thank you. It's oh. here she's speaking. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Just a quick Not comment. You. I see it's almost 12 o'clock. Um, but firstly, um, Prof. Roberts, thank you so much for an insightful presentation. Um, I really learned a lot, and I think we need to have more of these kind of discussions to make us all aware of what's going on in the ODL research field. I remember, and I know you will also remember that um, Prof. Willoff also gave a presentation during the RNI week, I think it was two years ago or so, if I remember correctly, exactly on, on his framework, and he was also referring to the fact that um, UNISA and South Africa is not really um, doing well on the macro levels. And then I totally forgot the, the framework because we don't talk about these things and we, we don't remind each other. So thank you for this. And um, I'm really going to, to look at your presentation when I get the recording um, to really look at these, these other levels because we work in ODL and yeah. So that's important. That's one thing I wanted just to share. And then also on a comment you made on workload, um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm involved in the ODL um, professional development project of UNISA where the um, colleagues are doing a certificate in online learning in ODL, ODL teaching and learning at Oldenburg University. And after each um, cohort finishes, we actually do um, an ODL writing workshop and um, Prof. Litseka and um, the um, 
UNESCO chair and ODL is supporting us also financially with this project. Where the, the colleagues who complete um, then attend these workshops, um, it's not compulsory, but they attend. And they are so enthusiastic about ODL and they come from different colleges. Um, but to be honest, the time is just not there. They attend and they're working on research and many of them don't complete. Not because they don't want to, but simply because they then share they are so overloaded and they have to do this and that and marking and um, the exams, et cetera. So this is definitely a dilemma. And um, this is also showing that people want to, in my opinion, do research and want to publish, but simply can't get there because there are other priorities. <clears throat> um, also, maybe another initiative, and I think we are doing every one who's involved in ODL is doing something in his or her own corner. Um, we are, I'm the program manager for the EMIT in ODL and student numbers are low, but students are doing research in, in this structured masters. And we are working, and Dr. Mudaw and I are working in this um, program and we are working hard to um, get these students to publish on their mini dissertations, although um, it's not also not compulsory. So one is published now in a local journal and one is submitted to a local <laughs> journal. Um, exciting stuff on Ubuntu and um, one from the University of Iswatini on um, research that's going on there that we co published with. But these are not coming through, as you also said, um, and this is my experience and I've shared it on the chat as well. Local journals in general take quite a bit, quite long to publish our research. So I think it's coming through and we need to have these kinds of discussions. So in closure, thank you so much again for everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we'll just take the last uh, person so that uh, Prof. Uh, Roberts could respond. If she has any comments, then I hand over to Prof. Lesaka. So over to you, Rochelle. I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Yes, you are. Well, thank you so much. And um, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Prof. Lesaka, and Prof. Roberts for a very insightful presentation. I really enjoyed it very much. I'd just like to... Um, 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 a comment made by Prof. Van der Berg. As an academic, I've been, um, ODL research is one of my fields that I enjoy publishing in, but unfortunately um, with um, um, all of our, our the pressures, we just heard now that we have to mark 900 exam scripts for this exam. So with the result, my colleague, the one colleague who I encourage to attend, of course, we aren't looking at attending anything or um, that isn't, that is not going to assist us um, in marking exam scripts and compiling new exam papers for the January examination. Uh, we need support. If we want to be involved, we definitely need support as academics within, um, um, within the field or from your side, Prof. Litseka, or I don't know how, but we need support so that we can then publish in the field of ODL. So it's just a suggestion from my side. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Prof. Uh, Roberts, then uh, Prof. Yeah, Litseka yeah. will take over. Yeah, I think Prof. Roberts... Lost her. Yeah, I need to draw your attention to... I think there are... There are comments in the chat. There are two that I really thought I would like to flag, and maybe when Prof. Roberts responds, we can talk about those. Um, okay. Zulu Pilani says, who should teach research methodology at academic level, or at what level of study should students be well versed on research methodology? Is there a gap? In this regard, I think all of us, professors, uh, Gubani, Professor Fandil, Professor Hose, everybody else, we should be able to deal with this. Uh, Prof. Roberts, I'm just saying it's not just your question, this is a conversation. And then we have a, a very, um, I think, a very important comment, also a question. It comes from a guest from 
um, KZN, Tsibisa uh, Zelake, says, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I'm a scholarship holder in KZN and I work with colleagues who from other units, unfortunately, research is not infused into their KPAs. I know they have a passion, but how do we deal with such barriers? Um, at UNISA, we, we, are, we are all aware that research is one of the KPAs. I think the question here refers to a situation where research is not built into one's performance appraisal. I thought I would raise this because my fear was that we might actually close without paying attention to, to them. Okay, Prof. Roberts. Okay, um, well, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for those who made comments. Um, um, Professor Van den Berg, the, the previous um, uh, commentator as well, where you were, I think, hitting the nail on the head in terms of research outputs and staff who do not have the physical capacity or emotional capacity to add on to their workload. And I think that needs to, that's highlighted that that almost needs to be a separate um, seminar on its own. So what I've highlighted here now is saying this is the picture. This is what is actually happening. What is important is what we're discussing now is how do we mitigate that? We can see the results. We are not getting the publications we need and the staff are not um, able in, and I'm saying able, not, not, not that they're capable, they're totally capable, but many need that research support. And I think what I'm hearing is I'm hearing the initiatives that are being carried out by the UNESCO chair. I'm hearing the initiatives that Prof. van der Berg is carrying out with the, 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 the masters. I'm hearing a lot of the research that, that we are doing in, well, the previous IODL, but correctly speaking now is the ODL research unit. Um, we're hearing work that is being done in CSET, and I, I'm just mentioning the ones that have been mentioned here, um, Prof. Hurst talking about CHS as well, and I'm, I'm thinking that to bring all of this together, we need one, we need a consolidated way of doing it, because there are too many of us scratching at the side, and we're not talking to each other, um, and, and particularly I'm, I'm saying here to Prof. van der Berg, and I'm saying this in the, in the most polite, nice way, is she's talking about this project on staff um, development uh, in ODL. And I know that you and I are, are doing work on that as well. And we should all be talking. And that's the biggest problem we have at a university of our size. And that's why I'm very appreciative of, of these seminars that Prof. Tech is organizing, because this is bringing us all together so we know what each other is doing. So that that's my answer to that. And then um, I should probably have ended with that because that, that that's the positive note. Um, what I the the other two questions that came after that were about um, teaching of research design and methodology. And you'll see, you know, if I had to go back to my one slide um, right at the end where I spoke about ODL research gaps and opportunities, and I'm talking about the under preparation of students. Um, it's not only the under preparation of students. I have, I have also been um, astounded, or maybe find some other words, when we have staff members who already have PhDs or masters who are battling with basic research, and and there's there's a flaw somewhere in the system. So I'm not pointing fingers anywhere here. I'm saying it has happened that that many people are not prepared to do research. I'm working with the head of another department who, um, in a very senior position at the moment, we're collaborating on, on, on a project, and she says to me straight out, she says, my PhD wasn't very good at all. I need expertise in research methodology. And I'm only saying all of this to say it all comes together. We're seeing it from our students' perspective, we're seeing it from the staff. And if I had to just give my two cents worth is I believe that we are in serious need of those kind of courses, whether we're talking MOOCs or whatever we're talking on research design. And that's not just ODEL research design in general. And um, so I'm sort of now ending on that, that sort of note, but maybe that is a bit of my hobby horse, is that we need this bridging course to get people ready to carry out research, because I'm seeing it with my students, I'm seeing it with other staff members as well, but on the other hand, we have so many staff members who are 
experts in this area. We've got to mentor, mentor people and bring them up to, to scratch. Thank you. All right, Dr. Dr. Luko was supposed to hand over to me. Now she's quiet. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I already did. I said after the after Prof. Robert's uh, uh, comments. So, okay, I, I, let me let me yeah. hand over to you officially now. Yeah, I'm old school. I need to say hi. Here is a bed and run with it. Thanks a lot. Okay, please <laughs> do. No, thank thank you Dr. very much. Yeah, and thank you for the brilliant work of facilitating the Q and A. Now. Let's have one of our energetic, newly crowned full professor. My God, aren't we happy at the College of Education? I'm, I want to invite one of our newly celebrated full professor to give a vote of thanks. I, I'm hoping that this vote of thanks will be full of some high level professorial sentiments. Professor Cindy Lenguvani, let's give a round of applause. Yeah. Probably. Oh, you know what? This is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they, they always say when people do that, they are trying to get something out of you. So um, I'll, I'll wait for the request. I'm joking. Um, good day, colleagues. First, I would like us to really give a big round of applause to, to Professor Roberts. Um, as you know, one of those that do work with hair, I'm very proud of you, Jenny, because you've actually done what we've always been thinking can be done by Olaf, but you've brought it at a local level. And now we understand what those numbers that we've been watching being done by people abroad, what they mean to us within UNISA and as a country. So, um, allow me to thank you so much you and your team for the great uh, presentation that you 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 actually uh, presented presented to us and i think you've given us food for thought um not only that also you you have allowed colleagues to rethink their strategy on how they 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 actually want to approach their research so you didn't just present but you've given us a homework we we and the, the good thing is that it's october uh, so people can actually now sit and think in terms of their personal development plans on how they want to approach next year when it comes to how they want to do odl so thank you very much um then again uh, I'm glad that our colleagues are here from the regions, uh, Dr. Trevisa, uh, Mr. Zulu, and I see you've been asking questions because what happened with um, the whole restructuring of CGS, the regions have now had to suffer the, you know, the, the, the absence of IODL in the regions. Of course, uh, I accept, like we've always been saying, that the issue that um, research is not part of your KPAs makes it a bit difficult. But we all know that we have people like uh, Mrs. Olomisa, uh, the, the late Bongani Mguni, that have presented at conferences, even the, the team from Rustenbeck, they've published with Dr. Nsamba. Uh, there they are people also in Cape Town, Western Cape, that have published with, Dr. Rob, with uh, Professor Roberts. So we know that when they support at a grassroots level, um, even support staff can actually do very good ODL research. Now, Prof. Litzega, allow me to just add to your list uh, when you approach uh, Prof. Dabuskahne, is to say that um, an ODL university is very much strengthened by uh, support staff and also academic staff. So they, they need to ensure that uh, research as, an, as a KPA is actually given to everybody, then people can decide the percentage at which they want to get involved. That way, we'll get all the students' experience, the support staff experience, and all these parts. When you look at all the ODL gurus abroad, they were actually not academics. Most of them were support staff, and that is why their research influences how work is done in the ODL uh, field. So I've been asked to say thank you. Uh, thank you so much that uh, to, to everyone that was in the program. Prof. Lotrit, uh, you know where we come from. It was nice to just look at you and see how calm you are. 
um, uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Dr. Aluko, you know, you've you've been with us. In fact, I, I think you should have joined UNISA long ago. Uh, so we always uh, enjoy having you uh, in our midst. And uh, Prof. Liteka and your team, thank you so much for actually coming back and, and talking to, to, you know, recognizing our talent within UNISA and letting them present their work. And thank you to all the colleagues that are here. You've actually taken time to come and be here for engagement. We still invite you, no matter what shape or form we are in, as a ODL, I mean ODL research unit, our task is to support you with your work and I think also UNESCO also is there to support you with your ODL research. Reach out to us, we'll see how we can assist. Thank you so much and I wish you well with your work. Thank Prof. you, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for, for being here. We are, um, you know, we are, you don't know how blessed we are as a as the UNESCO chair, we, we can bank on the loyalty of some of our most loyal patrons. There are some people here that are always here and we wish many people could always be here because this is the place where we try and bring all ODL experts across the world, as I said earlier, to share and, and basically give us new ideas and move us forward, basically galvanize and stimulate debates. It's my view is that if we can have this platform where the debates and research are shared, then we are creating an opportunity for further research and um, for inspiration so that others can go on. The final <clears throat> uh, seminar of the UNESCO chair will take place next month. It will be given by Dr. Mabaleri Sielieto, who used to be the one of my postdoctoral fellows. Basically, she was up until last year, she was my senior postdoctoral fellows. I think I've published close to eight or 10 pieces with her. Very, very energetic. She is now, she's just been appointed as the new director of the SADAC uh, Distance Learning Center in the Botswana Open University. So she'll be coming here to share <clears throat> lots and lots of work that dovetails her work at the UNESCO chair and the work that she does in Botswana. Again, this brings in some perspective coming from across the border. So watch this space as you saw from Jenny's uh, advertisement flyer. My team is working behind the scenes already to finalize the flyer and put it up. Please watch this space. The end of the year uh, session crowns everything else. And then afterwards, we're going to go on the UNESCO chair, Le Hotla, where we will then release the 2022 plan again we are really rumbling on. So you can rest assured that come 2022, this space is going to be even more enhanced. We are looking at a whole range of experts coming from across that will be featuring here to share. Experts. So with that, thank you very much. Stay safe um, and, and, and get well. Thank you for supporting us and, and thank you very much. Have a good day, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Bye. Yeah, this is where you all are mute, and I can hear you. Have to say all oh, bye bye. Now I hear bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Bye.